Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guest this evening. Former editor-in-chief of The Crisis Magazine, the NAACP's flagship periodical, and a former editor and syndicated columnist at The Washington Post, Jabari Asim is the director of the creative writing at Emerson College. His many books include What Obama Means for Our Culture, Our Politics, Our Future, the novel Only the Strong, a heartfelt polyphonic ode to 1970s black America, and the N-word, who can say it, who shouldn't, and why, which the Los Angeles Times calls a sharp-eyed musing on the history of the word and how it bears or should bear on a media-driven culture that is dangerously ahistorical, especially in matters of race. He is also a Guggenheim Fellowship winning poet, a playwright, and an acclaimed children's book author. Tonight he joins us with his latest work, We Can't Breathe, a collection of eight essays that disrupt the conventional narrative of black history in America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jabari Asim back to the Free Library. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Laura. Um, as she said, I'm talking about my book, uh, We Can't Breathe, uh, tonight. And it is a collection of eight essays. So what I will do is read to you uh, a couple of highly abridged, deeply condensed uh, versions of a couple of the essays. Uh, shouldn't take more than uh, about 30 minutes. And then we'll have time for questions and comments. So thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, a lot of these, I guess a couple of really quick prefatory remarks. Um, I tend to write from certain perspectives. I write from the perspective of being a husband, uh, being a father. I, my wife and I have four sons and one daughter. And alternately, from the perspective of being a brother and a son. Uh, so that sort of sensibility kind of filters through everything that, that I approach. And in this book, um, I'm always hesitant to, to generalize about uh, material that actually goes into specifics. But one of the things that resonates um, throughout is sort of my interest in uh, the black body or the dark body. A um, couple of experiences. One, the experience of inhabiting a dark body. Um, and the experience of inhabiting a dark body in spaces where there often aren't dark bodies um, and how that, how that affects that particular experience. I'm going to read a little bit first from an essay I have in the book called Shooting Negroes, and I'll go right after shooting Negroes into a piece called The Elements of Strut, uh, which is hopefully self-explanatory. When black people first set foot in the territory now known as the United States, they stepped onto contested ground. Before there was a legal term for what they were, before the law carefully circumscribed their hearts and loins, each of their footfalls was subject to contention. How many strides until the end of their world? How far could their limbs take them? To the edge of the plantation? To the back door of the big house? Centuries before Trayvon Martin took his last steps in a gated community in Sanford, Florida, his ancestors confronted similar boundaries. Gated neighborhoods? tri-gated states. By the 1860s, several of them, including Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and Oregon, prohibited black people from traveling anywhere without proof of permission. Your name? George. What's going on there, George? I'm with the Neighborhood Watch. We've had some burglaries and vandalisms lately. This gentleman was walking in the neighborhood I've seen before on trash days, going around picking up trash. I don't know what his deal is. Is he white, black, or Hispanic? Black. Wherever such laws or customs prevailed, bands of dutiful Americans took on the task of enforcing them. Slave patrols, the forerunners of police cruisers, and neighborhood watch squads first emerged in South Carolina around 1704. The patrols were based on earlier efforts in Barbados, where the act 
for the better ordering and governing of Negroes. That was official legislation there. The Act for the Better Ordering and Governing of Negroes. Uh, it empowered all whites with the right to stop and investigate black people who, left to their own devices, were considered likely to steal or run away. In the view of patrollers, Negroes were as dishonorable as thieves. Consequently, they were to be apprehended and punished for moving or walking about without permission. In modern terms, patrollers were expected to be on the lookout for black people who were, quote, up to no good. When everything they did was wrong, even something as innocuous as breathing could be cause for harassment or death. As Trayvon Martin discovered, 21st century racial maladies often pose the same trap. This guy looks like he's up to no good or he's on drugs or something. It's raining and he's just walking around looking about, George Zimmerman reported during his 911 call on February 26, 2012, moments before he gunned Martin down in cold blood. Zimmerman's easeful assumption of authority is both significant and historically resonant, but no more so than the notion that a black man simply walking in his own neighborhood, no less, is automatically suspect. Zimmerman's eagerness to take matters into his own hands reflects an implicit mandate that white citizens are as responsible for their safety as police officers are. Inheritors of a patroller complex deriving from those early acts for the better ordering of Negroes, they are, in effect, deputized to investigate anyone, read black people, who seem out of place. The idea that African Americans can commit a crime simply by existing is more than just a deeply entrenched racist misconception. It's also an idea rooted in capitalism's need for cheap, exploitable labor force. These two cancerous strands came together in the philosophy of prosperous landowners such as George Washington, who cast his practice of working slaves to death as a humanitarian gesture. Without constant work, he argued, they would be ruined by idleness. Those strands can be tracked as easily as a trail of spilled Skittles to a modern prison industrial complex that runs on equal parts racism and greed. In the 17th century, forced labor was still something of an equal opportunity and justice. States such as Connecticut and Florida arranged their prosecution and parole docket, dockets according to planting schedules so that whites incarcerated in debtors prisons could be cons conscripted to help with the harvest they found themselves paying off their debt to society by toiling like slaves. The industry became less diverse after the Southern Rebellion, also known as the Civil War, when emancipation proved highly inconvenient for ambitious Confederate planters eager to shake off the dust of their inglorious defeat. Black codes emerged, making criminal offenses of vagrancy, loitering, and public drunkenness. There are two suspicious characters at the gate of my neighborhood, and I've, I've never seen them before. I have no idea what they're doing. They're just hanging out, loitering. Okay, Mr. Zimmerman, can you describe the two individuals? Two African-American males. They look, uh, I know one is in a white Impala. How old do they look to you? Mm, mid to late 20s, early 30s. With the help of cooperative judges, black men and women unfortunate enough to be caught moving around, looking about, or even standing still in the wrong place at the wrong time, were hauled back to the same fields where they previously sweated. Southern law officers taking full advantage of the 13th Amendment's timely loophole allowing compulsory labor as a punishment for crime set out to turn as many newly freed blacks into criminals as they could. States and counties filled their depleted coffers by convicting those they swept from the streets and leasing them to farmers and businessmen. Prison populations swelled, foreshadowing the incarceration disparities we see today. 
A conversation about brutality and identity goes right to the body, the author and legal scholar David Dante Trout has, has observed. The body, he goes on to argue, becomes the currency of control. Consequently, any discussion of black bodies, at least regarding their sojourn in America, must also include the idea of ownership. For black people to claim possession of their own bodies, they must also declare themselves persons, capable of agency, language, and independent thought. Perhaps unsurprisingly, that humanizing impulse remains partly indigestible in a nation whose economic foundation depended on the idea that black people were not humans to be respected, but property to be maintained. Property cannot be maintained if it dares to move about freely, and even worse, resist being apprehended. Stand your ground laws and juries that wink at wayward vigilantes. Suggest that violence against unarmed black Americans continues to take place with the consent of the state, and by extension, the governed. My name is George, and I live at the retreat at Twin Lakes Subdivision. I'm part of the Neighborhood Watch. The American Vigilante is an offshoot of the posse, a stalwart guardian of community virtue, so moved by threats to his home and hearth that he must take matters into his own hands. Impatient with the pace of cosmic justice and his neighbor's heartwarming faith and holy reckoning, he knows his quarry is quick on his feet, too swift and evasive for plodding squad cars and donut swollen patrolmen. It takes a real man to do a man's job, and who is more up to it than him? Deputy Dog straps up and hits the streets. Name, Caltech, 9mm, PF9, caliber, 9mm, length, 6 inches, height, 4.3 inches, width, 0 0.9 inches, Barrel length, three inches. Price, $330 to $390. Weight, fully loaded, 18 ounces. Trigger pull, five pounds. Effective range, seven yards. Hard chrome and hollow points, baby. He's ready to roll. This is the Wild West, and he needs no stinking badge to prove he's a natural-born badass. OK, and this guy, is he white, black, or Hispanic? He looks black. There have been far too many break-ins lately, broken windows and assholes trespassing on his peace. On one of his moonstruck patrols, someone will die, sprawled on a lawn, torn up from a bullet designed to expand and disrupt the body's soft insides. A few bleeding hearts might object, but security is seldom achieved without a price. Flyers distributed to residents advised them to call him, not the police, to report suspicious activity. We must send a message that we will not tolerate this in our community, the flyers declare. Not here, not on his watch. Are you following him? Yes. OK, we don't need you to do that. Before Trayvon, Benjamin Martin was evicted from his body, before the open-eyed husk of him cooled and stiffened on a grassy lot in Sanford, Florida. He was a child, the son of Sabrina Fulton and Tracy Martin. He was clearly loved and is sorely missed. He had no criminal record. He had wronged no man nor violated any law. If not for his parents' persistence, he'd be like so many others, buried without inquiry and presumed to have died while up to no good. Okay. The second essay is from, uh, it's, an, uh, it's an abridged version of a longer essay called The Elements of Strut. One of the subjects I examine in the book 
is ways in which mainstream popular culture abuses or, or respects the African-American ethos. And, and by ethos, I, I mean the distilled experience of black life and in all its myriad subtleties. A just grew stew of sights, sounds, memories, movements, and emotions, marinated in blues, swing, bop, soul, funk, gospel, and rap. A deep blue blackness beyond category and bred in the bone. So high, you can't get over it. So wide, you can't get around it. So low, you can't get under it. So insurmountable, it would seem, that merely attempting to define it inevitably diminishes it. The fact that blackness can incorporate such things as technique, practice, and the conscious application of style, while simultaneously transcending all those things, makes it nearly impossible to pin down. As a result, it, it often infuses American life as more of a tantalizing abstraction than a concrete attribute. Some intangible quality derived from black people's history, not on this continent, but on this planet. Anyone who's seen the Norfolk State Marching Band, a New Orleans second line, or three black girls turning double dutch knows what I mean. Ralph Ellison touched on it when he described the singer Jimmy Rushing's ability to give voice to something which was very affirming of Negro life, feelings which you really couldn't put into words. When trying to wrap my vocabulary around blackness, I find myself reduced to opaque mumbling. I want to say that I may not be able to describe exactly what blackness is, but I know it when I see it or hear it, or feel its irrepressible rhythm urging me to get on my good foot and dance my way out of my constrictions. Blackness has a timeless, undeniable force, simmers at the heart of every African American story, and by extension, nearly every American saga. One story that I find particularly compelling is the movement of dark bodies through spaces. In ideal circumstances, the human body flows in a state of strut, a jauntiness, an ease, a response to the rhythms that animate the earth. To strut is to reflect the graceful rotation of the planet in one's breath, in one's step, in the pace and melody of one's speech, in one's swerve and laughter. I strut, therefore I am. Strut is the body in motion, occupying, manipulating, and moving through space. Strutting requires freedom, the liberty to flex and stretch. Lately, I have been watching a short film by Andrew Margitson. His camera follows the brilliant dancer Little Buck as he floats, pops, and glides through the foundation Louis Vuitton in Paris. Now, dancers are often so supple, they can't help themselves, walking with a distinctive grace that signals their talent. Little Buck doesn't walk like that. He enters the museum as any ordinary mortal would. He is lithe and trim, to be sure, but with an unassuming gait that hides his kinetic genius. Then the music begins, and he leans into the air, his ankles as improbably bent as a hapless guard defending LeBron James. His voiceover narration introduces his style as a blend of hip hop and ballet. As performing artists, as dancers, he explains, we see everything as art. Up the escalator and through a light-filled space adorned with paintings, Little Buck maneuvers his undeniably dark body, pirouetting altering time and gently challenging gravity. He bends to the point of crumpling, only to reassemble, restoring his smooth musculature as if by magic. The beauty of the dance is a timely distraction. Little Buck moves adroitly in a space where figures like his have seldom been regarded with respect or delight. His sublime whirl helps me forget, however briefly, 
that darkness in a body complicates even the most basic stroll, reduces an inalienable right to an elusive privilege. The unbound black body is profoundly inconvenient. The dark muscles, the bones underneath, the vulnerable organs and the sheltering skin, each comprises a segment on the map of a plundered continent. Each is redolent of conquest and empire. Four centuries ago, our ancestors were marched at gunpoint across sand and savanna, far from their home villages to near death and misery in the confinement castles of the African West Coast. Those who stumbled and lost their footing never made it even that far. Inevitably, history complicates our strut. Then, as now, locomotion sometimes can require treading the slender border between life and death. Headlines remind us of all the same and different ways a black body can collide with its inconvenience. Breathing, walking, waiting to cross at the light, using a golf club as a cane while crossing a Seattle intersection, heading home while carrying candy and a can of iced tea. Any of these can be seen as unforgivable trespass, alien intrusion on ground that must be defended. The wrongful arrests, the point blank executions, the gunshots to the back, the militarized police responses, the illuminating silence of white self-styled liberals, and most critical, the paucity of convictions all point to the same existential question. How can we strut in a strange land? While my contemplation of strut respects the question of how to live in a black body, I am more interested in how to escape my own imprisoning concept of that body. I don't believe the black body has more potential than any other kind, but I am concerned with the extent to which its capabilities are suppressed by one's own internalized limitations. Racism and its accompanying cruelties have shaped me to police myself, to restrict my own movement through spaces. And by spaces, I mean both actual and metaphorical. The great resistor Carter G. Woodson warned, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. He might have added, independent thinking seldom goes undisciplined. Some black people use this fact to justify subjecting their children to corporal punishment. They contend incorrectly, I beat my son so the police won't. On any given day, how often do I manage to keep oppressive thinking out of my head? Am I ever free from an imagined white gaze? How often do I succumb to beating myself? Unlike the dancer Little Buck, most of us can't trip the light fantastic. We are left to rely on others in the struggle to rouse our bodies and spirits into motion. When I stagger from my house still groggy with sleep, I turn to the generous gods of bop and groove to help me get my hustle on. I pop my earbuds in, press play, and soon I'm walking down the street like Bernie Casey and I'm gonna get you sucker. My theme music guiding my feet. My playlist is subject to the twists and turns of my fickle tastes, but some tunes never lose their favored status. Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. Steppin' by the World Saxophone Quartet. The In Crowd by the Ramsey Lewis Trio. The Sidewinder by Lee Morgan. Giant Steps by John Coltrane. My playlist 
propels me through public spaces where my presence might be questioned or challenged. One August morning, I was walking with earbuds firmly in place when someone called out to me. I turned and saw a white cop standing in the middle of the street, the sun glinting off his mirrored sunglasses. You doing laps, he asked. I told him I was. Which lap is this? My second, I replied. He gave me a thumbs up. I nodded, unsmiling, and went on my way. I couldn't tell if he was just being friendly or letting me know that I was under surveillance. Sometimes we strut to reassure ourselves that we belong, that we have a right to the air we breathe and the space we occupy. At other times, we strut as if we could take back everything that has been lost. I wonder what songs would have been on Elizabeth Eckford's playlist. In 1957, decades before iPods, Eckford found herself walking alone to Little Rock Central High. Separated from the eight other black students who would join her in integrating the school, she was forced to maneuver through a crowd of furious white women and men. They spat poisonous curses at her with all the enthusiasm of monkeys hurling feces at gawking humans. One could say those rabid Arkansans were in a prison of their own making, trapped in a destructive mythology, prevented from exercising their full humanity. One could almost pity them, if not for the impact of their psychosis on the black people then living in Little Rock. They could not sleep, eat, learn, or walk according to their own desires. I have long been intrigued by the famous photograph of Eckford strutting carefully through that corridor of shrieking flesh, her expression stoic, her books held close to her chest, her eyes hidden behind dark glasses. I'm amazed that she stayed on her feet, reached her destination with no bop or groove to drown out that loathsome chorus. In contrast to Little Rock, it was mostly men who pushed and shoved a young black woman named Shia Nwanguma at a Louisville Trump rally in Kentucky in May 2016. Video footage shows her assailants jostling her and cursing her while Trump hollers, get out from the podium. Like the predators of Little Rock, the feverish Kentuckians can barely restrain themselves in their eagerness to inflict harm on a black woman's body. In both incidents, nearly 60 years apart, a black woman walked a solitary path with her life in danger, her own deportment a dramatic contrast to the uncivilized pack yelping and snarling around her. This is called strutting while holding body and soul together. In Cicero, Little Rock, and other hotbeds of manic segregation, racial wilding was often the province of civilians, unlettered white men and unfulfilled white housewives acting out their frustrations. In the 21st century, when strutting where one chooses is still seen as intolerable black impudence, Police officers become gun-wielding surrogates. Licensed to kill, they can exercise collective white hysteria by inflicting violence on our dark skins. In addition to satisfying a psychological urge, policing of the black body performs a critical economic function by supplying the nation's need for cheap captive labor and fodder for the prison industrial complex. For these and other reasons, African Americans move through space fully aware of a central fact. Police officers break the black body with the reliable blessing of the state. Since Darren Wilson's killing of Mike Brown removed any doubt that an objectionable strut is grounds for murder, Black Lives Matter activists have marched in the path of their predecessors challenging the popular compulsion to crush and consume blackness. Still, the best service they contribute 
may be their expressed willingness to question the sanity of returning again and again to request protection and justice from a government that will not save us. The question reflects a perspective older than this republic, offered by Thomas Paine long ago. He wrote, common sense will tell us that the power which hath endeavored to subdue us is of all others the most improper to defend us. The bloodthirsty impulse, the desire to see the dark body suffer, shared by many of those who benefit from unfair advantage based on skin color, may prove impossible to rehabilitate, a prospect that many of us are reluctant to acknowledge or confront. In 1975, I was wowed by a Broadway musical called The Wiz. There was much to admire in the brilliant all-black reimagining of L. Frank Baum's classic. My favorite characters had no memorable lines, no crowd-pleasing solos. Instead of Dorothy, say, or the Scarecrow, I was drawn to the road. In Jeffrey Holder's Broadway staging, the famous yellow brick road was embodied by a quartet of golden, nappy-headed brothers who escorted the main characters on their journey to Oz. George Faison's choreography combined the exuberance of the cakewalk with the flashy footwork of a Jackson 5 performance. In the big screen version of The Wiz, produced three years later, director Sidney Lumet replaced the silent dancers with 26 miles of vinyl floor covering. The film's disappointing box office receipts can't be blamed on that single change but it sure sapped the joy out of it for me. I think I found the road dancers appealing because they reminded me of those smooth operators who bopped through the St. Louis neighborhood where I grew up. In Big Apple caps, bell bottoms, and platform shoes, they looked as if they leaped out of those men's fashion ads in the back of Ebony magazine. I thought men who looked like that were the epitome of cool, free range strutters whose knack for swagger extended beyond the block. Elegant and powerful, they were high-stepping, hip-dipping, masters of the slide, the glide, and the insouciant saunter. I imagined they could go anywhere, even to the white side of town, and return with their black bodies intact. It was a fantasy, I realized, a vision of a free black future that keeps us on our feet. Bodies in motion, we strut despite the persistent riddle of history hard at our heels. We strut toward a future that is neither clear nor promised. We strut with consummate style. We strut with surpassing grace. We strut therefore. Thank you. I believe we have microphones if people have questions, comments, brickbats, tomatoes, eggs. <laughs> I can duck behind the podium. I'm quick. Tell us what's happening with Black Lives Matter. I can't tell you. I mean, we'd have to talk to Black Lives Matter activists. I'm a journalist, I observe, I report on what I've, what I've seen, but I'm not qualified to speak on behalf of Black Lives Matter. What do you see? Uh, I mean, what I, what I talk about in the um, essay is one of the most valuable things I think Black Lives Matter, uh, the movement for Black Lives has done is challenge this, this age old adherence to the politics of respectability. And I do talk about that in the book to a certain degree in that uh, there was this belief that if black people were well scrubbed and articulate and dressed in their Sunday best and were prayerful and humble and sweet, that um, it would affect uh, the consciences of those who prefer to oppress us. Uh, it's also known as moral suasion. 
uh, that we can draw people to this idea of, of a common morality. I challenge that. I don't believe that. I think it's a great idea, but I think 400 years of that technique, uh, that approach suggested that that's probably not going to be effective. Uh, one of the ways we see it uh, is when someone um, is murdered, say, by the police or by a vigilante, uh, we make a concentrated effort to show how good that person was. And often it was a good person. You know, Philando Castile uh, did a number of wonderful things. Sometimes the unarmed black person who's killed has a criminal record. And I think what the Movement for Black Lives is saying is it doesn't matter. It's a black life. It's a value regardless. And I think they're, they've been really instrumental in particular with that, uh, that particular approach. And uh, one of the ways I think it's illustrated is there's a documentary called Who Streets, uh, directed by Damon Davis and, and one other person, which is about uh, Ferguson and its aftermath. And for me, there's a really demonstrative scene where there's a community rally in a space like this. And the then president of the NAACP, Reverend Cornell Williams Brooks, is at the podium. And he's a, a minister. He's an experienced minister, um, you know, well-trained. And he's speaking uh, with the cadences of an eloquent pastor, which is what he is. But you can see by his rhythm and by the ways that he pauses that he's expecting, he's leaving room for the audience to roar with enthusiasm or amens or wells or the things that, that uh, black audiences often do in, in that particular instance. The preacher's on a roll, so people holler, preach, preach, or well, amen. So he's kind of waiting for those, and they don't come. Right, so there's these, there's these pauses. And finally, some people in the audience begin to say, let them speak, let them speak. And they take over and they basically shut him down and he has to leave the podium. And a St. Louis rapper named Tef Poe takes the mic, speaks in a completely different way, but just moves the crowd to committed action in a way that the previous speakers could not. And to me, it was really illustrative of a shift in what the notion of leadership is. And I, and I think uh, the movement for black lives is, has, has been pretty judicious in discerning a need for a shift in leadership styles and a shift in uh, what activism should look like. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what comes after capitalism in the United States and in the world. And I appreciate you talking about how much capitalism in the United States really necessitates racism. and. I guess my question is, do you think that, you know, under our capitalist system now, that you can ever really be truly black and free and really fully inhabit your body and own your own body? And if not, what do you think a post-capitalist, you know, system would look like for black people? Um, you know, I, th I think any, any discussion of, uh, and I do try to draw those connections, you know, it's, it's, you can always follow the money, and that's where the black bodies are. Like, for example, there's a new study that shows uh, that uh, black people are disproportionately incarcerated in Vermont. There are no black people in Vermont. There are more black people in Vermont behind bars than there are black people in Vermont walking around. So it's all, it's all about the money. It's all about uh, for, for profit prisons. Uh, and sometimes when a, a for-profit prison is opening a space, the state has to guarantee them that there will be a certain percentage of occupation, right? And, and the way that's taken care of is to scoop up black and brown bodies. And this is a historical thing. Um, any system, even post-capitalism, you know, a, a, social, a democratic socialist um, arrangement, for example, uh, what I can't do, what I'm not able to do, and what I think someone else might be more qualified to comment on, is it still doesn't sufficiently account for the animosity that arises from visible difference. Uh, you know, if, so if you're in this, this new economic system and we're still visibly different, that seems to always be uh, accompanied by a certain degree of virile animosity. Um, and that, that to me is an even more, more pressing problem than the economic structure that I think we both agree doesn't work. Uh, but I mean, that's one of the things that I suggest in the book. That's, that's something we really have to confront. It's not a rational thing. You know, sometimes they tie it to economics, but sometimes it's just our presence. There's something about our presence that arouses hate sometimes in people who don't know us and don't know anything about us. Um, and I have no idea how to alleviate that. But I think first it has to be acknowledged and 
it seldom is. It actually is seldom acknowledged. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is um, a couple things. One is black people commenting on race and the experience of black people don't have authority. White people don't even, progressive white people don't even listen to, to black people typically about these things. For example, I won't, I won't name any names, but once a year there's a, there's a book on the bestseller list by a white author talking about anti-black racism. And white people buy it by the millions. There's seldom a new or original idea in any of those books. Usually they're a recapitulation of things that black writers and thinkers have been saying for 400 years. And they don't hear it or see it. But with the right cover on it and the right cover photo, they flock to it. Right? So, so it's, it's really complicated. But the other part of that is, uh, and the value is, um, well, it's not the value actually, but this is the way I would twist the argument. Uh, the argument often goes, uh, we need to have a reckoning in this country. We need to have a difficult conversation about race. We need to talk to each other across racial divisions. Um, and you know, that's a noble sentiment, but I think it's the wrong sentiment. I do think uh, the time is more ripe than ever before for a difficult conversation. But it's a conversation that our progressive white allies need to have with other white people. Because black people have been having that conversation for 400 years. And it's disingenuous to suggest that we haven't been, right? So I think that's, that's, that has to happen. I don't see it happening. I don't foresee it happening. I wouldn't predict that it would happen, but it needs to happen. You know, the power of white denial to me is just amazing. How do you still did not say there's no racism, we're fair, this is a just country, when we have so many of, of these murders of black people on video? The guy that was. Uh, shot down, one of the most amazing ones, the one that got it was shot down in South Carolina Walter by this Scott. policeman named Savage. Uh, Walter Scott. Yes, yes. I mean, it was all on video. Uh, the, the cop killed him in cold blood, tried to place a, the uh, gun by, by the victim. Yep. Yeah. All of this was on video. And uh, did he get any time? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think he was convicted, which, uh, is, which is rare. But okay. he, he, well, he was convicted. Yeah. And then the one uh, that Rahm Emanuel, Emanuel in Chicago hid, the McDonald. Uh, Laquan boy, McDonald. The b boy, I mean, he was sh clearly walking away from the cop. Right. Uh, of course, Emanuel, the so-called mayor or whatever he is, hid it so he could get elected. For over the, a year. Because the Spanish guy was about to, you know, beat him, uh, yeah. really beat him up in the election. Yeah. Chewy. Uh, and uh, here's Rahm Emanuel with his chest stuck out like he's some kind of decent person after he hid this. Uh, I mean, it's just, and then everything's always said to be so fair. Oh, how do you do not keep denying, denying, denying when it's on video in black and white? The clear murders of black, of black people. Well, I think it's symptomatic of something that I call narrative combat, right? So when I post something like that, my caption is usually watch this narrative unfold, right? Because the initial narrative with Walter Scott, for example, was that he attacked the policeman. That he, that he took his taser from him. We saw the video, we saw that none of that happened, but even white liberal progressives then posted after seeing the video, well, if he hadn't done anything, why did he run, right? So the, narr the narrative was always shifting. When, you know, you have, it's fight or flight, right? You got a few seconds to think about it. This policeman's gonna shoot me if I stand still, if I, if I'm, if I peacefully comply like Philando Castile, or if I run. So I'm taking my chances. It's, it's, not, it's not an indication of guilt. So one of the things that I'm looking at in the book is, is narrative combat, these stories that um, are, are, are clashing. So one, one aspect of oppression that I'd like to see more work on is that I think that those who would oppress us get between the oppressed and their stories. And so one, one way to do that, even in the age of video, is to immediately come out with a different narrative. I mean, that happened with Mike Brown. That happened uh, with Sandra Bland. It happens all the time. Uh, and so I think one of the things we, we, we always have to do, just vigorously, is challenge every narrative that has to do with black people, right? It just, just to be reasonably skeptical as a matter of self-defense. Thank you again for coming here. Um, and I apologize uh, for my own attitudes, and I, re and I realize in a way that there's nothing that I, um, there's no way that I can properly sort of get to the root of, of what I deal with uh, growing up the way that I did, but 
I just want to say one of the most influential books I ever read when I was a young man was a book called Confessions of a White Racist, hmm. which was basically written by a liberal white guy from Texas who examined his own, even though he was you know, trying to be very progressive, he examined his own background and sort of basically convicted himself of, of what he still would fall into. Um, my question is, are there um, places that are doing better than other places? I think, for example, of um, LGBT folks who move into the city because that's a more accepting kind of a place. They find a better mm -hmm. life. Are there places that are doing better? Is there anything that we, whites or blacks, can learn from those kinds of places? I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a, it's a matter of place, but there, there are instances, there are episodes in which we see that happening. Even, even the Black Lives Matter movement, we saw really remarkable demonstrations from white allies, from Asian allies, from Latino allies. It really, in many respects, uh, has been supported. Uh, by a multiracial coalition, and I'm encouraged by that. I mean, one, one episode in, in Boston, um, young people were marching against police brutality. And two of the young people were children of mine, so that's how I got this, this, this eyewitness report. When they decided they were going to block the, the highway, when they got to the highway, and this is night, uh, you know, the policemen surged forward, and the, um, at, at, at that point, they were rotating who was, who was leading the front of the movement. And at that point, it was uh, a Latino group. And the Latino group stopped in front of the police and turned and faced the marchers and said, uh, and I, I thought this was amazing. My son told me about it. They said, white allies to the front, please. And they shifted, and the white allies moved to the front, and the policemen relax immediately, right? I mean, there, I mean, there are exceptions to that. I mean, uh, Occupy. Uh, on the West Coast and the East Coast, we saw young white people brutalized by police. So it absolutely happens. But I mean, the common sense part of organizing is, in most instances, it's not going to happen. It's not, policemen are not going to brutalize white children. And so that, that this became a tactic, and it's an old tactic. I mean, you know, they, they employed it in the civil rights movement as well. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, it, what doesn't give me optimism about that particular thing is while, while we have those young people who are doing that, we have other young people who are organizing on behalf of white supremacy all over the country. I mean, the 2006 report by the FBI, I trust the FBI about as far as I can spit, right? Just as a matter of common sense. It's not an organization that's interested in my safety, well-being, or livelihood. But in 2006, they issued a report saying that white supremacists were infiltrating law enforcement in startling numbers. Um, and there's been no real action against that, you know. Uh, but we still have these conversations with white people where they say, the police are here to protect and serve. They protect us. They say, they, you know, they, and I don't know if it's, if it's that kind of policeman or one of those white supremacists who has infiltrated law enforcement. And it's reasonable for me to wonder in any interaction. So, um, yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, the, when people ask me, do I have faith, do I have optimism, a couple things. You know, Baldwin said, uh, despair is a luxury only white men can afford, right? And I agree with that, so I don't invest in, in despair. Frederick Douglass said, the price of being in the struggle is the struggle, right? So I'm prepared to do that. And I guess the thing that gives me most hope is that white supremacy has been unable to destroy my people. 400 years of concentrated, systematic, effort. We're still breathing. We're, we're still here. That really says something to me about our indomitability, and it gives me hope. What is your, thank you very much for your remarks. What is your take on um, the Obama presidency and what he was able to do and what he didn't do? Uh, a lot has been written about this. Yeah, I even wrote a book about it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Shame on you! No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I think that like one of, one of the things I talk about in that essay, The Strut, is that African American progress, in particular, is usually uh, two steps forward, one step back. Right? That's 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 throughout. So, I mean, earlier an earlier example would be Reconstruction. Right? So, uh, the first period of Reconstruction, until it was compromised in 1877 by the Hayes Tilden Compromise, and became something else. Entirely, there were enormous advances in terms of, of what black people could do. But immediately afterwards, the black codes were enacted. 
uh, which brought about sharecropping and convict leasing, which was sort of a legal way of, of recreating slavery, uh, approximating sl slavery as close as they could. So I look at it as like a, a pendulum. So I thought the pendulum swung one way uh, during Obama's years and, and the, you know, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. I think I used the phrase Newtonian in the book. There's this Newtonian response uh, going back the other way. Uh, so I, I think that he was hamstrung throughout by the politics of respectability. Uh, and this was pointed out, I think, most ably by uh, the comic duo uh, Key and Peele, which had the Obama interpreter, who, when the actor would, would say what Obama was really thinking or wanted to say. Uh, he was very much hamstrung by that. Um, he had to conform to notions of what a good Negro is. I mean, he really couldn't be more forceful than that. Uh, it frustrated a lot of black people. It frustrated me at times, but I acknowledge uh, the pragmatic necessity of, of walking that line. That's, it's the only way he could have been, been president. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think he did some valuable things. I think his, um, his foreign policy was reprehensible for the most part. And uh, we progressives who love Obama, we, we kind of overlook that altogether. And we, we shouldn't. Uh, it, it doesn't diminish the good things that, that he did. Uh, but, I mean, we're, we're really in the other half of that pendulum swing right now um, in extreme numbers. I failed to foresee that. I'm not a political pundit, but I certainly didn't see it coming uh, to this degree. But I should say, in all honesty, when I originally started writing about Obama, I was one of those people who said he couldn't win. Um, and then uh, I read a book by Shelby Steele, Bound Man, Why Obama Can't Win. And then when I read that book, I realized, actually, Obama can win, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and. And I feel really bad about Trump because my mother's 87 years old and she called it early when the Republicans were first lined up uh, at their podium. She called me, she said, I am so afraid. I've never been more afraid of a president uh, than this guy. And I said, oh, slow down, mom, he's not president and he won't be president, so relax. <laughs> and I was wrong and I feel terrible that, that I told my 87 year old mother, you know, you're overreacting. The old days aren't coming back, you know. Uh, so I, I'm not the guy. Hello, thank you so much Hi. for being here. You are really amazing. Um, I'm currently one of the Black Student Unions at my university, which is the University of the Arts. And um, a lot of my work has been trying to diversify the school, the university as a whole. And I wanted to know your thoughts on how, and I know that there are many systematic issues with higher education in general, um, but what are your thoughts on universities and colleges in these higher educational institutions taking more responsibility and um, really educating everyone who is a part of a campus, a community, things like that. Because I, I personally feel like there's, there's a lot to learn and a lot of times people are coming from spaces where they don't even see black people. Then all of a sudden they're in college with them trying to figure out like how do I talk to you, how do I navigate? Um, do you feel like maybe they should take more responsibility and enforce classes, training, more in their curriculum, things of that nature, and for the faculty members that work there as well, so that the relationships between students and faculty are better, um, yeah. they, I don't know, respectful, you know, something of the nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can talk a little bit about it from my perspective uh, at, at Emerson College, uh, which like every other college has, has had, um, spirited discussions around these issues, starting in 2015 when students began to walk out on college campuses across the uh, country, including ours. Um, and the first response, uh, I guess uh, when, when the students first protested, they protested at a faculty assembly, they came in and they said things, uh, they, I think they identified three areas where there were microaggressions and racism, et cetera. One was uh, the student life aspect of the campus, the dorms, the dining hall, they were running into comments they didn't appreciate. Uh, the second space, um, was uh, the, the classroom, and, the, and then you break the classroom up into two particular areas. One is the microaggressions they got from other students, and the others were uh, from professors. And it was horrifying, it was absolutely horrifying. It was no surprise to me, uh, because I'm not just an Emerson faculty member, I'm an Emerson parent. Two of my children have graduated from Emerson. And my daughter would come to me and tell me crazy things at professors, and I would say, who is that? Tell me who that is, right? Um, and so these students took the mic, and I'll be very brief, but they, they testified. So one student, uh, South Asian student said, the teacher told her, I'm never gonna learn how to pronounce your name. Yeah, so she, she said that. Um, another teacher, uh, she said two things in her multicultural 
uh, lit class. One, she told a South Asian student, well, I don't teach Indian literature because I hate it because all I write about is immigration, right? And she also volunteered. I just don't know why black people get so upset when they're compared to animals. I love animals. Yeah, she said that in class. So, uh, so the faculty response was, this was, this was in, let's say this happened in April, I can't remember the exact month. Faculty response was, um, let's just do nothing. And over the summer, these students will have forgot about it, they'll be on to new things, some of them will have graduated, some of these troublemakers will have graduated. Uh, but some of us, um, and myself, we, we co-founded an ad hoc committee. We started a committee on cultural competency, and we worked over the summer to address the, the students' concerns, which is, which is what has to happen. But one of the things that we were able to push through as legislation was that every faculty member had to take um, cultural competency training. Uh, the training, as good as it is, is, is not enough to overcome a lifetime of embedded racism. And I can say that while it was taking place, there was a group of older white men, uh, faculty members, in the back of the auditorium grading papers. It was a silent protest. Like, we, we're, we're not even going to participate in this. Right? So, it's, so uh, I think uh, Frederick Douglass said, agitate, agitate, agitate. And I think the solution is to not rest. Right, and, and to just keep pushing back and to keep resisting. I think we have to. So uh, I'm particularly interested in your answer to this as a journalist. Something I noticed over and over um, to an annoying degree um, was this d the, the narrative of post-raciality. Always coming from the media, always coming from white journalists, I never heard a black person assert that idea. Although I'm not saying that there weren't any, but every time I heard post -racial, that we're in a post-racial period, uh, this was coming from white people and particularly from white people in the media. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I, I felt all along that it was a setup, that it was a dog whistle way of saying, we don't have to pay any attention to what goes on with you now. You've got your black president, <laughs> sit back and shut up. And so, um, you know, I, and, but then when I started to engage white friends of mine, lo and behold, they were bought into it as well. Like they seriously believe that. So as a journalist who was in the midst of, you know, you've been a journalist a long time, wh mm -hmm. what was your take on that? Like why were, why were journalists falling for that okie doke and repeating it? Um. I'll be very brief because that's the last question. We we gotta, I gotta sign books or something. But um, it's a very good question. I think it's part of narrative combat. Uh, short answer is there's no diversity in newsrooms, particularly in decision making positions. So there's seldom a black person or a woman or or someone who might just raise a question about say a, a racist or sexist. Uh, comment. I think what you're talking about with the post-racial thing is still continuing right now with the use of alt-right and white nationalist instead of racist and white supremacist. It's the exact same thing. Uh, and more to your point, there was, a, there was a headline recently in one of the major publications that said, uh, black journalists have been connecting the Trump administration to white supremacy all along. Why didn't we listen? And my response was, who do you mean we? Right, you know, so, so I, I think that's, that it, it's, it's a short answer, but there's really a much longer answer. I mean, we could talk about it all night, but if you go in these newsrooms, and I spent a long time in these newsrooms, you know, there's, there's, there's not diversity of thought and perspective to such a degree that it would influence the way these things are covered. Okay, so thank you.